Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Kevin Ford. I'm from Lark Logic, and I wanted to talk ultimately um, uh, about uh, implementing some taxonomy triples uh, from Data Harmony exports in, in Mark Logic. Uh, I am I am not on the sales side of Mark Logic. Um, I'm not trying to sound defensive. I <laughs> I just want you to know that what follows is completely untutored on my part. But I realized I needed to probably say a little bit about what Mark Logic is. Um, uh, I am in fact on the post sale side. I do the implementation. I do implementation. Uh, but I was hired and I was brought into uh, Mark Logic um, in part for my semantic expertise. So, like I said, I begin um, talking a little bit about what Mark Logic is, uh, how Mark Logic, um, or what it does, as you say, and how it, it integrates semantics. A few identify use a few use cases with a special focus um, on the Library of Congress. Uh, the Library of Congress um, is a use case I know well because that's where I come from. Um, I came from the Library of Congress to um, to Mark Logic. I worked in the Mark um, the Mark Standards Office of the Library of Congress, which also hosts the Library of Congress Link Data Service, which is a semantic web semantic web application, and that's what that's what I did there. And finally, we'll talk we'll a little bit of a demo of data, uh, 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 showing you some data harmony um, data inside of Mark Logic itself, which I threw together last night. So, what is Mark Logic? In one sentence, Mark Logic is a uh, is the only enterprise NoSQL database. Um, that's how they they like to bill it. Um, it was it began life as a a search engine and document store, it then turned into an XML document store, so it began life very much as a, an XML document database. It is such, it has since branched out to JSON, um, so you can store XML in it, or you can store JSON in it, but it's still very much a document database. Um, but now, with semantics layered on top, you can do documents and semantics um, together. So it's not only um, SQL. It is enterprise um, level, they like to build, uh, it's billed as enterprise, um, has a special focus on search and query, but it also offers asset transactions. So there's um, fallback, it's high availability, um, replication, um, it's infinitely scalable um, horizontally. It's designed for very, very large um, installations. Uh, government grade security is built on top. There are some very um, big customers that, that use Mark Logic. To put Mark Logic in context with what else is out there, um, back in the way back when you had the hierarchical era, when you think of mainframes, IBM was an exemplary um, of this, uh, where you had had to write code that was application and hardware specific. Time moved on; the relational database um, was introduced to the market. Oracle being an example of that where you had relational data, your data was in tabular form. So think of a spreadsheet where you have rows and columns. That's what the relational database, of course, did. Um, it was very powerful. Your data had to be very normalized in order to do that, very structured in order to do that. But it, made that, it, mean, it meant that your database was now application independent. It could be queried by anyone, any user. So it's it separated finally from the, the mainframe. And finally, these days, you're into the NoSQL stuff. You've heard of Mark Logic, you've heard of Mongo, you've heard of Cassandra, you've heard of um, RDF triple stores. These are all NoSQL um, stores, uh, for example. They're, they tend to be schema agnostic. Uh, agnostic. They were designed from the get-go to be horizontally scalable instead of vertically scalable. There's only so big of a box you can buy for Oracle um, at the end of the day. With a special focus on query and search and analytics, and again, pushing more and more onto the developer side um, to interact with, with the system. <clears throat> Mark Logic has a lot of stuff. We're not going to go through this, so I just want to throw it up there. You can see it online. Um, but it offers indexing and JSON storage and a schema agnostic and is built for the cloud and asset transactions and backup and restore and replication and, and, and the whole nine yards. It has a very large user base. Um, I think of Mark Logic as the probably the, 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 the something that you've used without ever recognizing that you've been on it. I mean, you could say the same thing about MySQL and Oracle, for that matter. But uh, there are some very, very large installations of Mark Logic. Uh, it's very widely used in the government. Um, it's very widely used in publishing. The BBC website um, used it for the 2012 Olympics. So if you visited their one website once, that was being, that was being run in part on Mark Logic. Healthcare.gov, um, the very bottom layer of healthcare.gov is, in fact, built out of Mark Logic. Um, 
idea of exactly how um, broad it is. And the reason for this increasing um, popularity is because Mark Logic, um, once they brought in the semantics, really started to bridge two, two very big worlds. Um, and I'm bringing this up because what, I, what you can do with data harmony exports really can exploit, can exploit this a little bit. So on the one half of your brain, you know, it's very regular and very orderly, you have triples. Triples are extremely structured. Um, they're made of three parts, a subject, a predicate, and an object. You can almost imagine um, a, a triple store. This is grossly simplifying what a triple store is, but a triple store is essentially a very large table with three columns and an infinite number of rows, rows an S and a P and an O, um, that you can query. Um, it, uh, triples are very atomic. They do one thing very well. You can query Sparkle very, very well and find specific information with triples very, very well. On the other half of the world, you've got messy data, documents-based data, such as XML and JSON. It's very, very powerful. Um, it's extremely flexible. You can create some very, very rich documents and create some very, very rich applications. The power um, that we are discovering um, more and more is that when you bring these things to these th these two things together, you have a you can have a very very rich application. And I think um, even the JSTOR folks would, would recognize that when you bring these two things together, it, it, it's something special. Um, so like I said, triple store. There's an index. We'll talk very briefly about this, but this is a big deal um, because the triple store was layered on top of Mark Logic, which already had which was itself based on search. Um, you get search with. Um, Search on the semantic data in Mark Logic. I make a point of that because Sparkle has no facility to do search. Sparkle is um, very precise in its querying. You can't just search Sparkle data, um, but you actually can because of the, the evolution of this. So, getting to the use cases um, semantic search, so you can refine um, your searches with topics and create facets from it. So, um, over here, it's very difficult to read, but you, it says African National. Congress, which under the hood has been tagged as a political party, which shows up in the in the, the search results. Uh, oh, sorry, in the facets on on the side. Um, and this is this the, this is operating on a, on a semantic level right here. You can do do a little thing with um, with data harmony, where you tag it. It might be a political party because I recognize the African National Congress as that, but it, you have the ability to tag the information in such a way as to actually identify it precisely in the system. Linked open data. If you've ever been to, well, if you've ever been to Google, um, if you've ever been to Google's website and done a search, and you get the uh, uh, the, the knowledge graph on the right hand side of your screen, that's that linked open data. Google's taking that information. It's almost all RDF um, and semantic data. They bring it into their system so that when you search on a concept, and the Google recognizes that you just hit upon a concept, it tries to disambiguate exactly what concept are you looking for, um, and then show you a little nugget of facts. And uh, about it, about it on the right hand side. In this case, it's it's Ireland. Master data and master metadata management. Um, you can put documents into a system and then <coughs> link the documents together with very precise triples or relationships. You could just relink a whole bunch of information that I found inside those documents together and stitch it together. And finally, uh, dynamic semantic <coughs> publishing um, power. You can use relationships to to promote uh, content, taxonomy browsing, um, and the like. And finally, suggested related content, uh, related articles, suggestions, so on and so forth. But I really wanted to get to the, to the use cases to, to drive this home a little bit. So um, this is just a screenshot of the home page for Library of Congress's Linked Data Service, the, uh, also more commonly known as id.loc.gov. Um, it makes data available as linked open data, so it's all RDF. And what id.loc.gov hosts is the Library of Congress subject headings and the name authority file and a number of other smaller vocabularies. There are about 420,000 terms in the Library of Congress subject headings. It is not a thesaurus. Um, it is a controlled vocabulary or a value list. There are um, re relationships between concepts, um, inverse ones that are just purely related concepts, but also broader and narrower uh, relationships, although, like I said, it's not actually a thesaurus. The name authority file is a file with about nine million entries in it. There are some, a few relationships between entities and, um, in the name authority file, but mostly it's just a gigantic value list. 
um, you would find terms such as cooking or semantic web in the Library of Congress subject headings, you would find people such as Mark Twain or places such as Germany in the name authority file. When you're on id.log.gov, you can go to any page. Um, this, is the, this is the page for the concept working dogs. Um, you'll be presented with um, something that looks like this. The very top of the page is, is boilerplate, um, RDF stuff, URIs, types of, types of uh, resources this thing is. But a little bit further down, you'll actually see relationships between this term or this concept, working dogs, and other concepts or terms in the, in the in Library of Congress subject headings. So working dogs has two broader relationships, one to dogs and one to working animals, and has a number of narrower relationships, such as guide dogs and hearing, uh, herding dogs and hunting dogs, so on and so forth. And so at id.load.gov, you can go, you can look at all this information, and wherever there's a relationship, traverse all that relationship um, up and down. The Library of Congress also has a catalog for its books. The catalog is, of course, where you go to search for stuff, um, that being a technical term <laughs> for everything at the Library of Congress. Um, and when you go there, you do a search, you'll get a hit. Um, the top of the page, again, is mostly boilerplate, the author, title, when it was published, where it was published, description of the volume. And a little bit further down, you'll see um, links for related names and subject headings. Of course, these are names associated with this particular book and subject headings that have um, been applied to this particular book, too. So in this case, it's intelligence tests and cognition, uh, cognition testing, cognition in children, testing. They are blue and underlined, of course, so that you could click on them um, and uh, you know, expand your, your field of discovery. What, what happens when you click on one of those links, however, is it initiates a search for that term against the, the catalog. And it pulls back any um, item, any record, or any book in the catalog that also has that subject heading applied to it. So it's a phenomenal way to aggregate, of course, information. This is why you have subject headings. What you can't do, however, is say, what's the broader term for intelligence tests? Or what's the narrower term for intelligence tests? And then search in that direction either. Um, so um, a number of years ago, we started, we asked ourselves, well, what about leveraging that vocabulary at id.log.gov um, in order to expand that? to expand that discovery. And that's exactly what we did. Um, this is behind the firewall. Um, it's not been released, but I was able to get a, a screenshot of it before coming here. Um, and again, this is that same book, actually, and here's all that boilerplate. And of course, the subject headings have been brought out and underlined, so if you want to click on them and find more things that have been uh, cataloged with intelligence tests, you can do that. But well, the other thing we also did is we took these headings we fired off a search at id.log.gov and said, bring me back the broaders and narrowers of, of some of these terms in case the user wants to go up or down the hierarchy from this one point. Um, so on the right-hand side, you'll see some narrow, narrower concepts if you felt that intelligence test was too, was too broad, or if you felt intelligence test was too narrow, you could go up the chain um, and follow a broader term. And when you click one of those links, it'll fire off the search into the system for items that have been cataloged with, with those terms right there. So like I said, we wanted to use that, uh, take advantage of that vocabulary in the catalog. This might not seem that big of a deal, but in library land, this is a pretty big deal. Libraries have, for years, um, meticulously curated its authority and vocabulary data. Uh, it has broader and narrow relationships, but they've never exploited those relationships at the discovery um, level. Um, it's just, I've never understood the divorce, but you go, there's, there are people who just do LCSH all day, and they create broader and narrow relationships, but at no point is that stuff ever actually really connected to the books. Um, nevertheless, um, it's important that we, we're finally getting there. So, which brings us to implementing some data harmony experts. A couple of easy things. Um, in preparation of, of, of this meeting, I, I wrote Bob and said, give me something. Um, give me something. I am, I am a developer. I, I'd like to get my, my hands dirty. Um, a couple of easy things. So Bob sent a bunch of stuff over. The, the Zethas uh, file. Um, 
it is interesting if you want to store the information as documents. Um, you could actually parse the XML into documents and store it in Mark Logic if you wanted to do it that way. But I was also given a variety of RDS serializations, SCOS and OWL. Um, you can just load the, that data into Mark Logic. Um, if you load it as documents, it's not queryable as Sparkle, but if you load the semantic data as semantic data, it's queryable um, using Sparkle and also um, with the search functions. So how do we put some of this stuff together? I'm going to show you these and then we'll look at the demo very quickly. Um, but this was another thing that we, we did at uh, LC to exploit this a little bit. And imagine you perform this repository search. You looked for things in a catalog um, that had been described with gun, as, with, uh, about gun dogs. Um, you get near, no hits for that. Um, but there's this little link that said, did you mean hunting dogs? And the reason for this is because this term that you searched is the alternate label. It's the alternate form of this term. Um, one of the things that we can do is fire off a search into the background and say, okay, what did this person find? They found the alternate term. What's the preferred term? And present them with that. Say, perhaps you meant <laughs> hunting dogs. It's a little bit like that thing you get at Google or Yahoo now if you script search. Perhaps you meant X. And sure enough, if you click on hunting dogs, you will um, you will actually get hits in the collection. This is one of these vagaries of library data. Um, the alternate forms are in the data, are in the authority and vocabulary data, but only the preferred form, the preferred label, is in the actual record. Um, so if you, again, because there's this separation between the authority data and the catalog data, if you go to the catalog and search on a on a term which you think is perfectly legitimate but happens to be an alternate form of that term, you won't get anything. Um, you have to hit you have to hit the right combination, and that's what that's what this does. <coughs> Another thing that we can do. Um, this is a project that we're in fact working on right now. We loaded an absolute truckload of SCOS um, into Mark Logic, and we've been very um, pleased with the fact that we can actually build a Drop down suggest box type ahead with with SCOS inside of Mark Logic using the semantic functions that we have. Um, this is a pretty big deal. Um, I did not know the nature of this audience, um, so I put this little slide in here, knowing that there could be a coder or two in here. It's fairly common to know we know any X query, but that's okay. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring this little snippet in here is right here. This little blue block down here is actually the Sparkle query. Um, what I really want to point out was this top part right here. Um, that's just a search of the system. Um, it basically says uh, search for water, asterisk being a wildcard character, um, in case insensitive. And it will reduce the result set that is then queried with Sparkle um, by only those things that have the word water in it. Um, this is a, it's a, it's, I have to take my word for it, that's a big deal. Um, there's no search facility with Sparkle. There's a way you can pull back results and filter them. It tends to be very expensive, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of computing power. The ability to winnow your results down to a very manageable set, on top of which you fire off the Sparkle query, is, is allows you to actually build these types of suggest services out of this, out of this semantic data. So at this point, what I'd like to do is jump out and bring up the demo component. So as I noted earlier, um, I was given a, a handful of data uh, from, from somewhere. It included a vocabulary of news topics uh, related together um, by you know, SCOS-related relationships or SCOS broader and narrow relationships. And only ten, only ten documents. Not that many documents, but that's that's all we need. Um, and it's all loaded into the system right now. Uh, it wasn't a whole lot of data. And what we'll do is we'll just start with a really simple search. You'll see the type ahead uh, gets you no no entries found. It's a little clunky right now, a little messy. We spent about three hours on this. Um, so uh, one of the things I want to say was that. If it doesn't find anything in the vocabulary, um, you can just do the search, and it performs a full text search on the text, um, either the, the metadata or the article or whatever you've got in the system. But if you want to, 
you can actually do a search, a type of heading, and this was, this is pulling values from the vocabulary I was given. And if you want to look up news items involving or that have been tagged with the word Russia, you can choose a Russia from the list and perform your search, and it comes back with three hits. Easy enough. Um, you can click one of the hits, you see the article, and I actually had all the topics come back out in the bottom. Easy peasy. But on the left hand side is the neat is kind of the neat part. Um, what the net what the left hand side is showing you is the fact that um, if you're not happy with these results, you might try these other searches. And these other searches are based on the relationships found in the control vocabulary um, for the term or concept Russia. So the top one is Eastern Europe. If you wanted to back it out, come a level and just go up higher. Alternatively, you might have started with the word Russia, but in fact, you were looking for things about the Chechnya conflict. And Russia has been um, described as related to the Chechnya conflict. And if you click on it, you're not going to get anything. Um, but you can click on it, and actually you can just, you can keep going all the way up the, <coughs> up the hierarchy. The other thing that I wanted to show was this. Um, so I typed in the word arms, because um, I'm looking for arms talks. Um, and you'll see that it says use diplomacy. And that's because arms talks is the alternate label. It's not the preferred label for this term. Um, so nothing would have been tagged with arms talks. Everything would have been tagged with diplomacy. But you might have a user that comes and looks up arms talks. In which case, um, that person would, I hope, choose arms talks. It will write in diplomacy there, and they can hit search, and they'll get the one hit from that. Um, so again, uh, like I said, one of the things that we wanted to do is demonstrate how you can take some of this data and put it into one system, and using a little bit of semantic magic and a little bit of just um, plain old uh, document manipulation, uh, have it all uh, have it all come out. And that uh, brings me to the end in this slide. <laughs> um, and I ask for questions. Is that common? Is that stuff that you guys all have? I heard it was mentioned once or twice, or at least the desire was mentioned once or twice. I mean, there's a couple of UI issues with it, let's be clear. It gets, <laughs> that left-hand side gets cluttered real quick. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to implement, I just ran out of time and, and had to go to bed, was um, I wanted to make it so that if you searched on a term, it would collect all of the narrower relationships and the transitive relationships all the way down to the bottom of the of the tree, and then build this gigantic or query that would have pulled everything back from that point on. So if you really wanted to go to the top of the hierarchy and do a search for everything, um, you could do it. Or if you just wanted to say, you say you wanted Eastern Europe, you didn't want to have to go through each and every single country in Eastern Europe to figure out what was there. You just wanted Eastern Europe. Nothing was tagged with Eastern Europe, but things might have been tagged with Russia and Belarus and so on and so forth. You could do that type of search with that. And I just never, I never got there. Any questions? So, and I know <coughs> we're talking about this a little before you got here and um, before lunch. One of the things I'm interested in that you showed me um, that didn't come up in your presentation was um, we're used to tagging a document with subject terms. We put them in the XML as subject equals. We don't generally express those as triples right in the document, but you showed me how easy it was to run a simple on it and just extract all the triples from something. And it could be stored that way, so it could be queried in a different way depending on how your system architecture was. You want to, right. I don't know if you want to talk about that or show it for a bit, so just talk about that for a second. Um, happy to show it. Jump in um, if you see something that you like. So we were looking at, um, this is the data um, I was given, and this is the article, one of the articles, and you and can see that. Just to be clear, I, I sent him news indexer and pulled 10 random articles off Google News. Not literally the first time I found, but the first time that got any results. Pasted them into plain text and indexed them, and then I imagine that's, that's literally all I did. Right, so 
Right, it wouldn't be very hard. I mean, if you've got, you know, if you know, if you were doing a bunch of um, scholarly articles and it had a bunch of contributing authors to it, um, co-authors on it, it would be trivial to to take the to, to to take the program and identify the authors, which it does anyway. It already extracts the names and knows that they're authors, um, but then sit there and say this author. Um, or author A um, partnered with author B or was a contributor with author B, that there's a relationship between the two. And you could extract all that information and actually load it all in and create a pretty interesting graph, I would think, of the relationships between writers um, and authors of, of journal articles. Some of this stuff has more been done before um, in the sciences, but there's, there's probably a lot more that one, one could do here. So if you could start recognizing that this is a country or, um, this is a conflict and so on and so forth, depending on how it was captured. Um, I can safely say that if the data were actually stored as, um, well, there's a special format that Mark Logic likes for triples if it were in here. It actually, I wouldn't even have to load uh, that. It would just go in there. But um, <coughs> does that yeah, somewhat yeah. address what we were getting at earlier? I mean, I think so. It's just that we are doing all kinds of things relating. You know, you have a, a scholarly article, right? It's an XML. It has authors. Um, it has a journal name. It has a publisher, and then you give it subject terms. All that information is in there, and you can extract it and put it in a table, or you can easily extract it, extract it, and sort its triples. It would be depending on what your use case is and what kind of your system architecture is, what you're trying to do. It might be easier and faster to query if you store it that way. And the point, I guess, that I was sort of driving at is that it's not a big pain to take an XML document with well-formed fields and extract it into triples. In fact, it's basically it's a paint It would be very easy to take even a large collection, um, extract the information, and sort it as triples, to put it in a big thing so you can make a graph instead of doing it in tables or something. Right. And I think that would be of interest to Yes? So this, this is kind of a naive question, but based on the, the search that you demo, is it possible to either search, so like an example where you used hunting dogs, right? So if you enter in hunting dogs, you get a drop down in various things. But let's say it doesn't give you what you want, even if you hit that term when you search. Can you add a layer that says, you know, I want hunting dogs and dogs that <coughs> okay around guns? You know what I mean? Is there, is that, option available in that kind of system? Where you can add I think the short answer would be yes, but you'd be building it yourself. Um, so I mean, to, to be clear, I, I put all that together. There's actually no system. I mean, MarkLogic is a database with an application layer that allows us to develop on top of it. Um, it's not a uh, it's not a, a quote unquote product in the sense that it, it is a, it, you know, that's a nice, neat application that we just give out. It, it was completely custom. So if you wanted to um, build in smart such that, you know, hunting dogs or dogs that hang out with guns, um, that would have to be totally custom. 